Portrait of Omai is a 1776 painting by English painter Sir Joshua Reynolds, and undoubtedly it is his best work. A Polynesian man in the prime of his youth, gazing confidently ahead, with his tattooed hands gesturing on full display, positioned as if he were giving a speech. Despite being Polynesian, he is dressed as an Arab in bright white robes, and wears no shoes, which was atypical for the era, as dark, formal colours were more preferred. Through this, he embodies the stereotype of the noble savage, somebody from a pre-industrial peoples, uncorrupted by civilization. This is further emphasised by the background, the mythical Garden of Arcadia, which has been explored in previous paintings throughout history. It is a realm of enlightened and nomadic peoples who live off the unspoiled land. Who is this man? How did this painting come to be? Why was such a dark-skinned person given such a flattering portrait in the time of slavery and colonialism? It all begins at the creation of the universe, when the Polynesian god Ta'aroa broke out of his shell, one half forming the heavens and the other the earth. In the middle was Rayati, the holiest of all the Polynesian islands, where the heavens and the earth interacted. And as the most important island, it was also where the great Polynesian chiefs would meet to discuss inter-island affairs. It was on this island that Mai was born in 1751. As the son of advisors to these chiefs, he was well educated and never in want of food or shelter. In his childhood, he was affable and made friends easily. The Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean on Earth, and the islands are sparsely spread out, meaning this cluster of islands is all Mai and his people knew. They thought they were the only people in the world, a handful of paradisal islands in an eternal sea. But the religious and political importance of the island cut short Mai's idyllic childhood. When Mai was 15 years old, warriors from the neighbouring island of Bora Bora soon conquered Rayati. They killed his father, and the rest of the family fled by boat to nearby Huahine. Mai made it his life's mission to one day become strong enough to reconquer Rayati and avenge his father. Luckily for him, help was coming. Help from what seemed to be beyond the known world. One afternoon in 1767, a ship arrived on the horizon. It was the HMS Dolphin, a British exploration vessel. Mai and some friends attempted to sail out to it on a small raft. The dolphin responded with a cannon shot, tearing the small boat in half and injuring Mai. But Mai wasn't too offended. Quite the opposite, he welcomed the crew to the island. For if Mai could somehow get a hold of one of those cannons, his enemies on the other island would stand no chance. When Captain James Cook arrived at the islands in 1773, the 22-year-old Mai persuaded Cook to bring him along to the strange lands beyond the horizon, with the hope of returning with a ship, soldiers and guns that could be used to take back Rayati from the Bora Borans. At the time of Mai's arrival in London in 1774, there were around 15,000 black people living in the city around 1-2% to 2 of the population, mostly slaves and servants to the aristocracy, so his tanned Polynesian complexion wasn't completely alien to the people of England. In fact, they thought he was delightful, his new friends gifted him swords, fancy robes, and inoculated him for smallpox. Queen Charlotte hosted banquets in his honour, members of the aristocracy took him to the theatre, and he dined ten times with the royal society. Mai even attended the state opening of Parliament. Along the way, he picked up a new name, Omai. Oh At least that's what was written in all the guest books. This was probably a misunderstanding as Omai oh means I am Mai in Polynesian language. At the same time, Omai oh never forgot why he was there. He was there to raise an army. 
and would rant to anyone who would listen about Bora Bora or his father or the great god Ta'aroa, but nobody cared. That was all just part of why they thought he was so interesting. This adulation of Oh My was partially due to fascination, but there was also an ulterior motive. When Britain colonised a new territory, they would often, but not always, sign a treaty with native groups to give the colonies some kind of legitimacy, just to say, we're in charge now and you agreed to that. How much they abided by the treaties is contentious, but if Britain were to take over Polynesia, a treaty was required. Thus, Omai must be kept in the lap of luxury so that on his return to Polynesia, he could propagandise his fellow tribesmen about how great are the British. When he wasn't partying or meeting royalty, Omai frequented coffee shops, as did all middle class intellectuals and tradesmen at the time. It was inevitable then that he would bump into Sir Joshua Reynolds, the figure painter. Today we know Reynolds as an expert of his craft, one of the old masters, but in his time Reynolds was seen as a hack who would paint anyone who paid him enough money. Formerly, portraits were reserved for only the most wealthy and powerful in European society. Now thanks to the industrial revolution and expanding imperialism, merchants, sailors and factory owners were reaching middle class, and Reynolds was happy to break with the establishment to make a quick book. Sometimes, however, he put aside his ruthless bag chasing and chose subjects who inspired him. The iconic 1776 portrait of Omai was one such painting that he made free of charge. Reynolds painted and sketched a handful of pictures of Omai, and these have found themselves all over the world, but the grand portrait is clearly the best. It's not a commission for money or a government propaganda piece, but a genuine reflection of what Reynolds saw in his friend. This marks one of the first paintings of a dark-skinned person depicted with dignity in European art. Prior to this, most were either in the background, merely part of the scenery, or they were ridiculed as freaks. There were the occasional portraits of freed slaves like this one, but here is Omai. Oh an intrepid explorer in lands unknown, his posture modelled on Roman statues like Apollo Belvedere, unequivocally flattering, not a pet for the aristocracy, but his own person. Most importantly, this painting represents the rare moment two worlds collide for the first time, and it wouldn't be the last. In the infancy of the British Empire, many thought that Omai was the shape of things to come, New trade routes and colonies would open up access to meet new peoples, trade with them, learn from them, and of course, teach them the superior British way of life. But as we know now, it didn't turn out like that. This painting plays an important part in the narrative of the nation, the moment when Britain encountered the rest of the world. Reynolds kept the painting in the entrance to his studio for the rest of his life. When he died in 1792, an art dealer bought the painting for £105, about £16,000 today, and he passed it on to the Earl of Carlisle, where it hung in his stately home for the next 200 years. In November 2001, the Earl's family was running up debts, and so auctioned it off to Irish billionaire John Magnier for £10 million. Magnia wanted to lend it for display in the Irish National Gallery in Dublin, because loaning artwork to public museums gets you out of paying capital gains tax. A well-oiled plan, until the British government threw a spanner in the gears. A spanner in the form of a 20-year export bar for the painting, to give a British buyer, such as the Tate or National Gallery, time to buy the painting and save this culturally important painting from going abroad. An anonymous donor offered to buy it on behalf of the Tate Gallery in London for £12.5 million, but Magnia refused to sell. 
A mere £2.5 million profit is way less than he would get in a tax break. If Magnia was going to make any profit off this thing, he'd have to sell in Ireland. But he couldn't because of the export ban. This ban didn't completely prohibit it from being taken abroad though. The painting was shown various times in the next 20 years. In return for a temporary 2005 exhibition in London, the British government allowed an exhibition in Magnia's native Dublin in 2007, and in Amsterdam in 2018. In the meantime, it was kept in storage in the National Portrait Gallery. All this wrangling over the price had increased its value to £50 million. Even worse, the permanent export bar placed in 2003 was approaching an expiry date. On the 10th of March 2023, Omai would be exposed to the free market and the National Portrait Gallery was worried. Omai could go to another billionaire who might abuse it for tax purposes, or it could be bought by another museum in a country with no connection to the story of Omai. Ironic considering how most artifacts in British museums end up in the UK. Two thirds of artworks placed under an export bar leave the UK permanently once the bar is lifted. So it was likely that if the picture left the UK, we would never see it again. It was a roll of the dice. The gallery drew up three plans to save Omai. Option one, the best case scenario, buy the painting outright. Magnia assured them that if they can raise 50 million, he will sell. The NPG originally planned a large nationwide fundraising campaign starting in March 2022, but after the war in Ukraine led to sky-high energy prices and rapid inflation raised the cost of living, it just wasn't appropriate to ask the public for money. The campaign was scaled down to just the museum's members and a few mailing lists of people already connected to the museum. Option 2. The nuclear option. The National Portrait Gallery may only have a grant of £3.5 million, but the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles has a budget of $8.6 billion. The museum, founded by an Anglophile oil baron, has bought several British masterpieces over the years and displayed them for free in one of the largest museums in the world. This is better in that it will definitely end up in safe hands who are certain to look after it, but unfortunate because the painting is historically insignificant to the United States other than sharing a birth year. We would lose part of our cultural heritage, but at least Omai would be safe and in public view. Option 3. The government could step in and give the National Portrait Gallery the money to buy the painting. But amid the energy crisis and 13 years of underfunded public services, it's hard to justify dropping £50 million of taxpayer money on one picture. I think it's worth it. £50 million amounts to less than three hours worth of National Health Service funding. But that's not what your average voter thinks, and don't expect any help from the party of national decline. The export bar expired on the 10th of March 2023. The NPG had only raised half of the required £50 million. The painting was at the mercy of the billionaire art market. And the buyer was... the Getty Museum. But not in the way you'd think. Seeing as though the NPG had raised half the money already, the Getty Museum agreed to share the painting. Every five years it would be shipped across the Atlantic to be displayed in London and Los Angeles. It may not be the best outcome, but at the very least, the painting is safe and it can go on display in London some of the time. And there's always the opportunity for the National Portrait Gallery to buy out Getty's half of the painting for it to stay permanently in England. But for now, the painting is in London and will be heading to Los Angeles in time for the 2028 Summer Olympics. I suppose the story of Mai's painting mirrors what happened to its subject. After two years of touring London, Mai returned to Polynesia. He had been unable to raise an army, the British sending him home with a suit of armour and a chest of firearms. Clearly, 
the outbreak of war in the 13 colonies were a higher priority for the British than capturing a small island in the South Pacific. Mai died, possibly of a throat infection, on the island of Huahine in 1779. He was 28. The islands eventually fell under French control, where they exist today as an overseas collectivity of France. Like his painting, Mai's home is shared with disinterested foreigners thousands of miles away. The National Portrait Gallery is in Trafalgar Square. At the end of a long corridor, you can see Mai on full seven-foot display, with all the kings, queens and aristocrats gathered round once again. <laughs>